Hello, welcome back. In this video, I'm going to discuss a little bit about the 2016 expedition. I don't normally talk about this trip. There's kind of a gap between 2013 and 2018 in, in my discussions. And a lot of it has to do with because it was one of the most difficult and hardest things I've ever had to accomplish. Uh, rain, uh, from, from everything I had to do before the trip, during the trip and the aftermath from the trip. It is important, I think, for me to share and to kind of reflect on it because it helped shape uh, who I am today and it gave me the necessary experience and skills to be able to coordinate my future expeditions in a much more efficient manner, especially regarding logistics. Back in 2015, I was working with a colleague on a Yanomami project where we were going to document and record uh, Yanomami mythologies as told by the elders in the Mavaka region and there weren't many left and their their stories and their histories is something that is a treasure that needs to be documented because once they're gone then it's gone forever um, yes it's passed down orally but we would like to preserve it as told by the original source. Then, to kind of add a little bit twist to that, when we discussed with the Yanomami school teachers, uh, we had thought that it would be a great idea if we took those Yanomami mythologies and created new didactic materials for the intercultural and bilingual schools. So it's kind of like a way where the, the school teachers and the Yanomami people can be involved in, involved in this project. Um, there's an output, there's a product that can be made that could be used uh, to to update their schools and it's kind of a win-win for everybody. Just like any other trip, there was so much excitement, ambition, high hopes, and when it came to departure day, yeah, I was already feeling a little tired, but I was ready to take on this challenge and, 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 and do this awesome, awesome project with my colleague and the Yanomami. When we arrived to Caracas, we immediately felt the effects of the crisis in Venezuela. There were shortages of food, water, electricity, medicines, and basic goods, and, and even, even toilet paper was a premium. In our apartment, we had um, uh, rolling outages, we had shortages of water, and sometimes for days we didn't have access to water. And that left for a very, I mean, very, very smelly bathroom. On top of that, there were shortages of currency. And, um, and if you wanted to exchange, like say, for example, $100, it required uh, stacks and stacks and stacks of bills due to the rampant hyperinflation. And that made, that made things very difficult to be able to purchase items to, to, to live, to eat, to survive. Um, so immediately right off the bat, we were already feeling overburdened by the crisis. And um, while we were passing through as travelers, it just put into perspective of what the people have to deal with on an everyday basis. We finally did make our way to Puerto Ayacucho, which is the capital of the Amazona state in Venezuela. And it was, uh, it was hot down there. And Venezuela was experiencing one of the worst droughts in history partly due to the El Nino effect. Uh, this is a weather phenomenon that occurs every two to seven years and it creates um, changes in, in climate patterns. And one of those changes is, is uh, um, drought and especially during the dry season in, in, in the Amazon. Again, there were shortages of basically everything, but on top of that, uh, the, the city was, it was very, very dangerous. Um, the house that we stayed at, it was burglarized by two armed men only two weeks before we arrived. The guy that was living across the street, he got shot in his own home. Uh, there was another day when I was leaving the hardware store and moments after I left, a customer was executed with a bullet in his head right there in broad daylight in front of everyone. So when you're living in an atmosphere or you're trying to coordinate a project in an atmosphere where people around you are in a constant state of fear, um, cautiousness, and people are getting shot and killed and their homes are being invaded, it kind of has an effect on your psyche and there's a there's a method there's a way of operating and navigating in venezuela and you really need to be around people that you trust people that you know that won't hurt you or try to exploit you and you know i've come a long way where i felt like i've gathered you know such a group of people then 
Then I got really sick. I had contracted some kind of infection, parasitic infection, and that caused really, really bad diarrhea and severe dehydration. I don't know if you've ever experienced dehydration, but it is not a good feeling. I'm not talking about being really, really thirsty. I am talking about dehydration to the point where your cognitive functions um, are compromised and your cogn your ability to think and, and, do every and do simple tasks are impaired. And I lost a lot of weight and on top of you know feeling unsafe and anxious and and trying and and dealing with the shortages of food and medicines it was it was hard it was difficult and one day i was trying to uh i was in the backyard of this person's home and i was getting tunnel vision i knew i was about to pass out so i made my way to the back door and I tried to unlock the door, but it was locked. And of course it was. Everyone locks their doors at all times. Um, and then I, I lost all my strength and I collapsed to the ground. And I tried to yell for help because uh, my colleague was inside the house. And when I yelled or when I attempted to yell, it just came out a little squeak like, help, help. And no one could hear me. And it's amazing how much energy you need to be able to speak, actually. But fortunately, I had a cell phone in my pocket and I pulled the phone out and I had just a enough energy and it took me it felt like it took me an hour it probably took me several minutes but it felt like an hour where I was able to send out an SOS message to my friend inside he got the message fortunately right away came out and saw me on the ground and was able to uh, make a mixture uh, a solution of, of salt and sugar to revive me and that's fortunate because you know salt and sugar was 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 uh, also part of the, the list of goods that that were in short supply so we were happy that we had those little by little I was revived and and finally I was able to make it to the bathroom in time. But, you know, that was a very, very bad time. And fortunately, I recuperated enough strength where I felt like I could continue on with this project. Then afterwards, we were hit with some very um, tragic news. Uh, the, the powers to be did not approve our project. And my friend was not allowed to enter Yanomami territory. And this, this really hit me hard. I mean, I spent months and months and months working so hard to prepare and fundraise only to get to this point and have our project just be halted. You know, you, you think about it in the past about what you could have done and should have done and what would have happened, but in the end, you know, that was just fate. I still had a family to see. I needed to go visit my mom. I needed to go be with them. So I decided that I, I have to go. I got to keep going. You know, I can't come this far without seeing my mom. You know, it would be unfair. I made my way to the Upper Orinoco. Uh, fortunately, I traveled. I did travel with a friend. And when I got to the Upper Orinoco, there was a kind of a burden that was lifted off my shoulders because you go from that, from, that, from that stress and anxiety of being in the city and all the dangers there. And then you're in the jungle and it's kind of like you feel free you know, and this, this, this familiarity of the, the Orinoco River and, and the trees and, and the birds and even, even the bite of the little, of the little you know, uh, blood-sucking gnats and the sting, that, that was even brought some kind of uh, peacefulness to my mind. Um, when we arrived, we were confronted with a whole new set of challenges. The drought had affected all of Venezuela, including the Amazon estate and including uh, the Yanomami territory. The river, the Orinoco River, was so, so low. I eventually met up with my friend Andrew, who, who is, who, who is uh, my guide, my motorist, and my translator, and we embarked on this uh, very, very difficult trip to get to Itokai. It took us five days, five days of going up the Orinoco River. And the reason why it took us so long is that the boat would hit ground um, many, many times, or when you hit ground, you had to shut off the motor and you had to take a pole and kind of push the boat until you into uh, deeper waters and there were times where there was just no escape you, you had to get out and just drag your boat across the sandy sandy riverbank and to add insult to injury the sun was brutal it destroyed me and like an amateur i did not pack a single tube of uh suntan lotion so i sustained second degree burns with blisters bubbling blisters on my shoulders and my back and it looked like somebody took a piece of firewood and just seared my skin all over it was really bad so I was not in a good state of mind or good state of you know physicality when I was going up the Orinoco River and then we had to cross the Guajaripo Rapids and that was hard because the rapids 
they're very low and you can't just motor yourself up the rapids you had to drag your boat and even though the river is low the current is still strong and there's so many rocks to navigate and to pull the boat through and there was a time when the boat was pinned against the rock and i tried to pull the boat uh away from the rock but while i did that i lost my footing and the rapids swept my feet and my right shin struck another rock and and i had you know injured it and, and cut my shin that cut eventually led to an infection and led to high fevers. Uh, we made it through, but it was, it was difficult. And there were some scary moments here and there, but we, we, we finally made it through. And going up the Orinoco River, it was eerie. Um, because of the severe drought and the severe dry season, a lot of the gardens, the Yanomami gardens along the riverbanks were burned down um, and the crops were just dried out. And that caused uh, all the communities to simply abandon their villages and go either on a Wayumi or go inland. So we're going up the Orinoco River and we're passing all these villages just empty, empty, empty. And we're thinking this is really, really eerie. On both sides of the river, there's just smoke plumes of smoke just coming out of the rainforest and you can see large swaths of land that have been burnt burnt down and it was just like a scene out of a movie and it's something um uh that just just didn't you know sit right in your gut fortunately we did come across a couple of yanomami that were uh fishing along the riverbank and we we can we confronted them and they provided us some details on the whereabouts of my mom and their family and unfortunately they weren't along the riverbank they had moved inland just like so many other yanomami have done but he said you know he could go get them so we we we, we compensated him for him to go into the to the rainforest to, to to at least inform them that i was here and that i was um ready you know to come meet me at the riverbank he 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 left and we just continued up the river until we finally spotted the trailhead to the Shabano, the village of where I stayed in 2013 and I thought okay you know I, I can come here hang my hammock relax recuperate embrace my loved ones you know just and just pick up where I left off in 2013 so we climbed up the riverbank walked a short trail to the village and I was just in complete shock of what I saw the whole village was just burned to the ground. And I'll let this video clip um, show you what I saw and some of the thoughts I had when I, when I entered. Well, we're at the, uh, the shop I know that I stayed at in 2013. Um, they're no longer here. They're, uh, they moved inland. Um, they just threw the shop away. Uh, I don't know how it got burnt. They burned it or it was an accident or whatever, but you can see here, this was my home. It's burnt to a crisp. Um, we stopped at Hasapue on the way up and paid a guy a machete to go get, uh, to go get him, to tell him that I'm here. So hopefully they'll be here in the early afternoon. Be really excited to see mom. It's been such a long time. My family, uh, uh, I got word from Hospital Way that one of my brother's wives had died, so I'm really anxious about that to see who it was. I hope it's, you know, I'm really sad, but I hope it's not one of the, you know, one of the girls I was really, really close with. Um, but we're gonna go back to the river, hang out there, because it's just, we'll just fry out here. The sun is brutal. This is one of the worst dry seasons ever. There's a drought, it's affecting the whole country. Um, you know, water shortages and electricity shortages, food shortages, everything shortages, and it's even affected the Yanomama here. So, it's five days. We've <laughs> took us five days to get here. Um, the river is really low. It's been really, really hard. Unfortunately, we'll only be able to spend a couple nights here, but um, at least I could say that I got to see mom and give her some of the gifts that we brought down. But uh, yeah, so check in later. Looking forward to seeing her in a few hours. I was feeling a little down. I have to admit, I was feeling a little depressed. I was feeling a little deflated. You know, um, just having to get through Venezuela, our project canceled, traveling five days up the river, getting injured, getting sick, getting burned. And then all you wanted to do was just go, go to your home and visit mom and then it's just burned to the ground. And 
So just, you know, it, it just felt like another hit. We retreated back to the boat and we had lunch um, while standing in the middle of the Orinoco River. That's how shallow it was. So we were in the middle of the Orinoco standing there. And it was hot and you couldn't even take a dip in the water to cool off because the water was also hot. So, you know, I was just, I was getting cranky. We waited and waited until finally someone just appeared out of nowhere on the riverbank. And it was one of my family members. And I looked up and, I, you know, I, I perched up and got really excited. And then more people showed up. And then finally, uh, my mom showed up with a, with a smile on her face. And I was just so elated. And I started climbing up the riverbank to meet her halfway and then when I approached her I just had this sort of whirlwind of emotions um, anger sadness happiness depression and I had instant for, for a moment for for an instantaneous moment I had this kind of burst of anger where I grabbed mom and I looked at her and I said damn it mom why do you have to live so effing far away and then she looked at me with blank eyes, not not understanding a word I said. And then after after that moment had passed, you know, I was just so overwhelmed with joy that I was actually with her, and and I held her, and I cried, and and mom cried, and, and other people were crying, and I just thought, wow, you know, think of all the everything that I had to go through, all the people that helped me, um, you know, finally was able to to be together with mom. In that moment, I said, you know what? Everything, everything is okay. It was worth it. All the trials and the tribulations to get here, to be able just to see her and hold her, I said it was worth it. Um, don't want to do it again, but if I had to, I would. Because they were living inland, that's where all their food was, so they couldn't spend much time uh, with us on the riverbank, only a few days, and we didn't really have the time or the means to be able to, to carry all of our gear and our luggage and secure our boat and motor uh, to be able to go inland. So we decided that the best thing to do is make a quick shelter along the riverside and just hang out for a few days. And of course, the goodbyes were sad, and I told them that I wouldn't... Um, that I'll try to get back as quickly as possible. And I don't know if mom will ever understand truly how hard it is to, to get from Pennsylvania to Itokai. But when I'm not there, I just hope that she understands and knows that um, I'm always thinking about them. I'm always working to trying to get back to them and not only able to to, to visit them, but to bring some gifts and, spend, and, and and come up with a way to spend even some time with them. What I really learned from that trip was my understanding and exposure to all these different kinds of Yanomami that live today. And you have, for example, my mother and her family that lived the traditional lifestyle of living in a shabano and a thatch roof and they hunt and they garden and, um, and they continue on. Uh, their way of life that was similar to how um, they lived when my father was down there and for, for hundreds of years and thousands of years um, with very little change. You have communities that are isolated that have never seen outsiders, you know, in generations or ever at all. And then you have those communities that are sort of in, with foot in two worlds, um, communities that, that, that are part of the Venezuelan um, nation state system. They live in Yanomami territory. They learn how to read and write and speak Spanish. Um, they, uh, they have become medics. They've become school teachers. Um, then you have the Yanomami that are quote unquote urbanized. They live in the cities and they have um, you know, married non-Yanomami and they've come and they've adopted that urban lifestyle and that urban culture. Well, thank you for watching. I enjoyed it and I look forward to the next video. Take care. Bye.